might be something of a tired refrain in these videos that I'm making, but uh, I want to remind my audience that uh, I'm talking, you know, I'm talking about Christianity today, but as with the other religions that I've talked about, trying to encompass all of Christianity uh, inside a 20 or 25 minute video is probably impossible. And to make matters more difficult, uh, there may not be a single claim to which all who identify as Christians would agree. At least some of the, you know, what have been called doctrinal claims throughout the, the uh, uh, centuries. Now I'm going to speak as if, you know, what I'm about to talk about is something that all and you know all Christians agree to, but that you know that may not be true. You know, please keep in mind I'm just trying to provide an educational video and an introductory educational video at that. So I'm not intending to offend. I'm not intending to offend. All I'm trying to do is give uh, some of the major topics, some of the major concepts. Uh, within Christianity. Well, the first thing I'm going to talk about might be perhaps the most uh, mysterious thing about Christianity, and that's the Trinity. So the Trinity, according to Christians, is a revelation uh, about the nature of God. Um, you might recall when we looked at Judaism uh, that uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the Adonai, God, was utterly mysterious since Adonai is creator of everything else but uh, is not like everything else. Uh, and you know, this much is still true <laughs> with uh, the Trinity because even though for Christianity uh, the divine has revealed uh, something about uh, his nature, uh, what we understand about it is at best a mystery. So uh, what is the Trinity? The Trinity is the claim that there is one God and only one God. Right? Christians uh, still assert monotheism. However, um, this one God has three persons the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father, Son, and Spirit. Okay. So the one God has three persons. Now, uh, each person is distinct from every other person of the Trinity, and yet each person is God. Each person is God. So a mistaken way to understand this is to say that there are three gods. Christianity says, no, there's not three gods. That's not what we're saying. Uh, another mistaken way of saying this is that, well, God appears as one of the three persons at different times. Christianity says, no, that's not it either. Uh, each person is distinct from the other, and it's not merely an appearance uh, by God. Each person exists. Each person is God. So what I just described there, and these two <laughs> misunderstandings, those are you know, two broad ways, you know, according to Christians, those are two broad ways that one can make an error in a belief about the Trinity. The first is uh, to deny monotheism, that there is only one God, and also uh, to deny that each person is the one God. The other broad category of error is to deny the distinction between persons. So the, the, the traditional formulation of the Trinity is that the, something like the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, the Father is not the Son, the Father is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Son, the Son is not, you know, so, so forth. That the persons are distinct, but they're each identical. They each are God. Um, other ways to according to Christianity, other ways to make this error is to say that somehow the three persons together compose God? I'd say, no, that's not it, because that would mean that uh, each is not God, right? Uh, only a part of God. Uh, other classical ways of uh, making an error about this is to say that um, you know, each person is a mode of God or, or appears in different ways as God. So a lot of times... When people try to explain the Trinity, they'll say something like, uh, well, just as steam and ice 
and uh, you know liquid are all water so is the Father the Spirit and the Son all God right? well you know that that's a you know it's an old error called a, a modalism and the idea uh, the, the the error there is to say that uh, the, you, know, you know steam and ice and water are not actually distinct from each other they're just different appearances of water and your Christians say well no that's not it either right all three are distinct persons. They're not just appearances of God. Right? They're distinct per uh, persons. Now it's, you know, Christianity comes under criticism for this, you know, for this description of the divine, for this conception of the divine, the Trinity, uh, by saying, look, it's kind of nonsensical. How can three persons be each identical to God but not identical to each other? Uh, and, and, you know, either not be polytheism, <laughs> Or, you know, not be three different persons, right? This, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And Christianity says, well, yeah, I mean, this is a mystery. I mean, we're talking about the nature of the divine here. You'd expect it to be easy to understand. Um, and, you know, Christianity can, you know, or Christians, <laughs> Christians and Christianity can further say, look, let's not pretend we have a clear understanding of what it means to be a person anyway. Right? There's a whole branch of philosophy trying to understand what it means to be a person, and there's no answer there that's easy to accept or doesn't have its own problems. We don't have a ready and viable answer that just cleanly understands personal identity over time. Uh, we, you know, <laughs> yeah, even saying that you know, each person of the Trinity is, is of the same being, let's not pretend we have a uniform uh, account of what it means to exist. Right? These are all still difficult to understand, even when we're not dealing with the divine. When we try to understand this as a divinity as well, of course it's going to be mysterious. So yeah, that's something that, that Christians can offer, uh, kind of in reply. Uh, so, but you know, this is you know, the first main concept about Christianity here is, is the Trinity. So the next thing we're going to talk about uh, is what's called the Incarnation for uh, Christianity. And the Incarnation refers to uh, Jesus of Nazareth, or Jesus Christ. And uh, the claim here is that uh, Jesus, of, uh, Jesus Christ uh, is the Son of God and the second person of the Trinity. So remember the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, these are three persons of the Trinity. Well, Jesus Christ is the Son, the Son of God. Uh, that in and itself, okay, this actually still hasn't quite got to <laughs> the, the Incarnation. What this means, is, or what the Incarnation means, is that Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ is both uh, God and human. Both God and human. This is to say that, again, you know, the second person of the Trinity, the second person is God. Well, Jesus Christ is God. But this is, you know, not to claim that Jesus Christ is somehow not human. Right. Now, this, you know, might be a little, you know, for, you know, it's kind of easy to say, you know, kind of off the cuff, but trying to comprehend what this means can be a little, you know, strange. After all, you know, it's also part of Christianity that Jesus Christ died. Uh, and is resurrected, right? So it was crucified on a cross, suffered a horrible, horrible death, died as a result of that crucifixion, and rose from the dead. So this means God is dead and came back to life? <coughs> it can be rather difficult to understand. Even to say, you know, it's like, well, how did this, you know, how did this Jesus come to be? After all, all human beings have a beginning. And, you know, we don't want to say that Jesus uh, uh, of Nazareth, Jesus, you know, Jesus Christ had a beginning, but does this mean that God had a beginning? And you know, Christianity, or at least most Christian theologians, would say, no, no, it's not to say that God had a beginning. And, you know, they kind of make the distinction that, you know, the humanity of Jesus had a beginning, the humanity of Jesus, you know, they try to go on from there, and 
it gets a little messy. I'm not going to try to, I mean, you could spend a whole nother video trying to understand or explain the Trinity, or excuse me, the Incarnation, uh, and you would still have a great deal of difficulty. <laughs> so I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to explain that there is a difficulty to begin with. Nevertheless, despite this difficulty, Christianity asserts, at least most Christianity, asserts that Jesus Christ is both God and man. There isn't an incompatibility between the two. Uh, and that his divinity is not diminished by his humanity. And even that he, you know, he's somehow you know, wasn't subject to the sufferings of humanity because of his divinity. Right? Had both. Even while he was suffering in life and was uh, suffering in his death on the cross, he was still divine. That wasn't somehow mitigated by his divinity. So, um, just as there are errors, classical errors, about the uh, Trinity for Christianity, there are classical errors about the Incarnation. And again, they fall into you know, two broad camps, either denying the divinity of Jesus or denying the humanity of Jesus. So, you know, ways of divine, uh, denying the humanity is to say, well, Jesus didn't really suffer. Right? Just, Jesus was God, just kind of looked like Jesus was suffering. Or, uh, you know, saying something like, uh, you know, when, when pointing to the fact that Jesus was, was human, uh, had a human nature, uh, it's like, well, yeah, and you can't really be God when you have a human nature. He didn't really get his divine nature till after his, his death and resurrection. Like, eh, you know, uh, you know Christ Christianity is saying, no, that's not it, right? Even while... He was walking around on earth and, and you know, preaching uh, you know, from the moment of his conception and to the moment, you know, all through his early childhood. Yeah, that little child was God. <coughs> so, uh, you know, just as the, uh, the Trinity is mysterious, so is the Incarnation. I mean, so is the Incarnation. Uh, but again... You know, we, we can criticize Christianity for this, and that's fine. I don't want to say don't criticize Christianity. Uh, but, you know, Christianity is, is going to say again, <laughs> it's like, look, let's not pretend we understand fully either the divine nature or human nature. So until we really understand that, all right, we need not say, or we need not, actually we need not, but we really can't conclude that there's some kind of contradiction in claiming that Jesus was both fully God and fully man, fully God and fully, fully divine and fully human. Right? And, and until you can lay out exactly what divinity is and lay out exactly what humanity is, uh, which we really haven't been able to do, and point to the contradiction. Uh, so with both, that's why, that's why I get a little tired at this point, right? <laughs> with both uh, the Trinity and divinity, uh, we ask Christianity to explain this, and the, not like we can. Right? That's a criticism of Christianity, but it's also their refuge, right? It's like, uh, because we say, well, hey, you should be able to explain this. And Christianity says, why? This is dealing with divinity. And it's not like we do a much better job just dealing with ourselves when, uh, when we use just our own powers of reason. Uh, it's probably an unsatisfactory answer. Right? And, you know, don't blame you. Um, nevertheless, it's, it's kind of a way to go as, as far as this is concerned. Uh, so, you know, here we got two main parts uh, of Christianity, uh, and that's the claims about the Trinity and claims about the Incarnation. Okay, so we have these two claims about the Trinity and about the Incarnation. All right. uh, now, Christianity is, at the very least, um, I don't want to say reaction to Judaism, but they definitely see their roots uh, uh, coming from Judaism. And they might add on a few details, <laughs> a few more details than, than the Hebrews necessarily would. So if you recall um, the story in... Uh, um, in the Old Testament, excuse me, about in Torah, about uh, the Garden of Eden, 
with Adam and Eve uh, betraying Adonai in the garden, uh, Christians say, well, as a result of that betrayal in the garden, humanity, all of humanity, uh, with uh, uh, all of humanity, uh, has what's called original sin. Okay. Now, original sin is basically to is basically the way of humanity saying, look, that this is how we're damaged. Right? We're damaged beings. Uh, we are somehow prone or uh, susceptible to sinning, to further betraying against the divine. Okay. Uh, you know, Adam and Eve, they, you know, they didn't have original sin. Nevertheless, they, they still betrayed Adonai. But that same betrayal, uh, as, you know, as a result of that betrayal, that, uh, that ability or that um, inclination to further betray the divine continues on with, with all of us. And there's very, various explanations how this is actually transmitted. I mean, various theologians have tried to uh, you know, give an account of how this works. That much isn't necessary necessary to uh, Christianity. The, again, this is you know, one of those times where Christians say, well, I don't know how it happens. I just know that it happens. <laughs> um, uh, but the, you know, the claim is nevertheless there that what happens is from generation to generation, we are susceptible to betraying against Adonai. Or the Trinity, excuse me. Now, if you remember with Judaism, Torah was given to the chosen people by Adonai as a way to reestablish that relationship with Adonai. Um, now, it doesn't take long looking at Torah before you realize exactly how difficult that it is to fulfill it. It's really hard. Right? And Christianity is, is going to say, yeah, it's really hard. In fact, you can't do it. And quite a lot of Hebrews, or at the very least, will say, yeah, it's pretty difficult to do this. Um, maybe we can't. And there's, you know, sometimes there's passages in Torah where uh, Hebrews are saying, yeah, we can't do this. We're going to be forever separated from Adonai. We are just cooked. This is, this is it. Um, so, your original sin is the problem to be solved. The problem to be solved. And Torah was supposed to be our way to solve this problem. You know, fulfilling the, you know, fulfilling the law. Now, Christianity is going to say, yeah, it, that, that's supposed to be the way to solve the problem. And, you know, we have to, you know, at least some uh, kind of human being has to be able to do this. And, and you know, Judaism says, yeah, we, you know, we need a Messiah, some kind of savior is going to uh, fulfill the law, bring all the nations under under uh, under this, or, or excuse me, bring all the nations under righteous living, and then we'll have our relationship established, reestablished with Adonai. And, you know, Judaism says this Messiah has yet to come. Christianity says, no, no, the Messiah came. Christianity says Jesus, uh, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, is this Messiah. Uh, Christ is not the last name of Jesus of Nazareth, right? Christ is, I think it's Christos from Greek, which is the Greek word for Savior, and Messiah is the you know, Hebrew word for Savior, right? This is So when Christians say Jesus Christ, they're saying Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the Savior, Jesus, the one who fulfills the law of Torah. Now, this is at least one <laughs> major point of departure between Christians and Jews. Uh, is is the claim you know is the claim that the Messiah has in fact come? So for uh, Christianity, uh, the, the Torah has been fulfilled, has been fulfilled, and is fulfilled by Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the M Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And through that you know, through that fulfillment, we have reestablished that relationship with the divine. Now, you might listen to, you know, what, you might listen to this discussion about original sin and how Jesus is the, uh, Jesus is the redeemer, this, this, uh, uh the Messiah. 
Uh, and you might think, well, hey, you, you know, okay, so Torah has been fulfilled. Jesus uh, fulfilled uh, Torah through the sacrifice. Uh, and, you, you know, th there's really nothing more left for me to do. I mean, that job's been done. I could just sit back and wait for uh, my salvation to come. I don't even, why would I even need to go to church or even say that I'm a Christian? <laughs> you know, Christianity says, well, it's not quite as simple as that. <laughs> uh, yes, Jesus fulfilled uh, uh, Torah, but you know, even according to a lot of Hebrew ideas about the Messiah, yeah, the Messiah fulfills Torah, but then you know, we follow along with the Messiah. We, we follow what the Messiah says. So if you just want to take that approach, it's like, well, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there's a little bit more to it than that. <laughs> so to, to really have this salvation, right, to really have this salvation, according to Christianity, you have to, ex you know, the phrase kind of quickly falls off the tongue, right, accept Jesus as your Savior. What, what does that mean? Well, one way to deny that Jesus is your Savior is to deny that you needed saving to begin with. And this is a very fast reply to Christianity. It's like, I don't need any salvation. I'm just fine with whatever it, it, whatever is going on, be it a, a divine creator or, you know, be it an empty universe, right? I don't need saving. Okay. And, you know, I'm not telling you you have to accept Christianity. All I'm saying is you know, this, this is from the Christian perspective. So here's one way to deny Jesus is your Savior. And that the, fir uh, the first is to deny that you need saving to begin with. The second is to deny that you need Jesus to do this. So, you know, there's various ways of doing it. You say, well, look, I, I, I'm a good person. Right? I live a great life. I'm moral. I don't kill anybody. I have, my, I have a job. I contribute to society. I don't need... You know, even if I need a redemption, I've earned it. Right? I've, I've done it myself. Uh, through my own efforts, through my own abilities, through my own work, through my own character, I'm a good person. I don't need Jesus to, to save me. So th these are two ways to deny right, that you know, Jesus is your Savior. And to accept that Jesus is your Savior, you have to kind of go the other direction. The first is to acknowledge that you do need redemption. To acknowledge your own uh, sinfulness. Right? Uh, you know, through original sin, through your own further actions after that, through, uh, uh, you know, your own character. There's lots of ways to, to try to go about doing this, but even just saying, I need this. I need this redemption. I can't do it. Uh, and then, yeah, on, on top of that, I say, not only do I need redemption, I can't do it. Jesus, Jesus' redemption is, is what can save me. You know, Jesus' sacrifice is what saves me, not something that I can do. I can't fulfill Torah. I can't earn a place at the side of the divine. I, I can't do this. So that would be, you know, so, so when you know, people say you know, to acknowledge Jesus as your Savior, those are the two big things, right? You acknowledge, first of all, that you need Savior, that you're, you're a sinner. Right? And secondly, that Jesus' sacrifice, not your own, Jesus' sacrifice is the sacrifice that saved you, and it's the only thing that, that could save you. Right? It's the only thing that could save you. Um, and this is, you know, usually through in, in Christianity, this is achieved, and or at least, you know, a big part of it, maybe not achieved, but a big part of it, or is necessary for, for this, is baptism. Okay? Is uh, baptism. And then asking for forgiveness, asking for mercy, which is, in effect, saying, I'm sorry. Right? Not only to the divine, but to everybody. So now we, we come to an interesting question for Christianity. Uh, so, you know, we just got finished discussing how Jesus is the one to have fulfilled uh, Torah. And even how this, um, you know, our, one's own redemption is found in accepting 
exactly what that's supposed to mean, but it's somehow accepting that Jesus, uh, Jesus of Nazareth is your savior, or Jesus Christ is your savior. Okay. Now, let's suppose there's no real puzzle about that. Um, we can, you know, we can look at Christianity and say, well, okay, so suppose I, I, I get this whole idea about Jesus Christ as my Savior. Why bother with the Trinity and why bother with the Incarnation? I mean, even, even if they're true, you know, even if they're true Christians, you, you admit these are mysterious. They are at best difficult to articulate, much less try to understand and it's not like you can explain it to anybody, right? They, you, by your own admission, they are mysteries. So why bother including them? Even if they are true, why bother including them? Now, a lot of Christian theologians are, are, are going to say that, uh, <laughs> that these revelations, well, they're important. Right? Whenever the divine has made a revelation about uh, his own nature, uh, that's been important. When you start back... Yeah, back in, in, in Torah, back in Genesis and Exodus, when the divine has revealed something about its own nature, that's supposed to have some kind of impact on us. That's supposed to guide us and tell us something important about how to live our life and how to establish this relationship between the divine and us. The same is true here with the Trinity and the same is true with the Incarnation. So, for instance, right, without the Incarnation, without the claim that Jesus... Uh, Jesus Christ is fully human and fully divine. If we just, you know, if we just ignore the divinity, if we ignore the divinity part, then we'll never realize that you know, our salvation was uh, so important to us, as I so important to the divine that the, that God went and got it for us. Right? We have been unable to do it. Yeah, without the revelation that Jesus Christ is fully divine, it would have been just another person to have purchased our salvation. And then we'd be beholden to that person, not to the divine. Right? And, you know, we'd have to owe our apology to that person, not to the divine. Right? So, in, in, without that, that, that Jesus Christ is divine, we would never know how involved... Uh, the divine has been in our own redemption, and, and that we owe our redemption to the divine. That would be gone. If, you know, without the claim, I suppose, you know, we just always said that Jesus was divine, but didn't really have the humanity part, we would never know that divinity is somehow compatible with humanity. That one can be both divine and human. You don't have to give up your humanity to be divine. And, you know, divinity is not diminished by humanity. That's kind of huge. Yeah, that's, that's an important thing. Without the Trinity, without the relationship discussed with the Trinity, uh, we wouldn't have the notion that, you know, this is how we're supposed to treat each other. Just as there's a family relationship within the Trinity, we're supposed to treat each other like family. And this relationship, it, it's not one of, you know, king, knight, and knave, right? It's not something like that. It's father, son, and spirit. They're family, right? They're family. And when you, when you consider, again, when you, when you consider the story of creation, where Adonai creates uh, Adam and Eve in the image and likeness of, of, of Adonai, again, this looks like some kind of family relationship. Uh, and without this revelation... We, maybe we wouldn't have any kind of notion of how this is supposed to, we're supposed to treat each other. Not just our own family members, but the fact that we're all family. We're all family. You know, Christian theologians will say, well, look, contrary to the idea that these are just weird mysteries that you kind of have to tack on to Christianity, they are important. Without these mysteries, we would never know that, you know, I mean, we're not divine, but our humanity can be something like this divinity. And the, you know, the best way that we exemplify this divinity is through our family relationships and how we treat each other with love and respect and equality. Okay. We care for one another even at the, even, even at the expense of our own selves. And, and not just blood family, but everyone. Everyone's your adopted family. 
without all of this, without the, without all these kind of revelations, we, we never know that, you know, yeah, we're, we're supposed to treat each other like family. But when we fail in that, we're supposed to be merciful.